Mark, you are a star investor and the publisher of GloomBoomDoom.com, one of the most famous investment reports. You had a great interview with Alex Jones from InfoWars. When you talked about we are in a multiple bubbles uh, system right now, is this the result of quantitative easing and low interest rates of the central banks? Yes, I think uh, one of the consequences of uh, artificially low interest rates and you know, we have $10 trillion worth of uh, securities bonds yeah. that have negative interest rates, negative. In other words, if I buy a Swiss franc 10-year bond, I will definitely lose some money on it. And so that pushes people into things where they think they can uh, make more money by owning assets, whether that is real estate, or stocks, equities, or uh, commodities, it, it leads to speculation. It leads to excess speculation. But uh, some people have said these ultra low interest rates and negative interest rates are completely crazy. And the people that buy a bond with a negative interest rate uh, belongs into uh, a clinic for insane people. But I just like to point out, if you are a believer that the whole system will collapse and that uh, essentially stocks will collapse, real estate will collapse, that you have an implosion of this bubble that we have now in everything, whether it's art or whether it's fine wines or whether it's uh, collectible cars and so forth, stocks, bonds, everything. If you believe in that collapse, then maybe to own a bond where you lose over 10 years, only two or 3% is not the worst investment. You understand? If everything collapses by 50%, but you own an instrument that uh, will give you a loss of just 3%, that is maybe not so bad, relatively speaking. That is the way uh, some institutions will think. Interesting. <laughs> yes, I mean, we are in a situation which has never ever existed in history that you lend money to someone and he will pay you back less than you lend him. Normally, when you lend money to someone, uh, say over the course of history, interest rates were, say, between 2 and 8%, something like this. But now we have these negative interest rates. Wow. So it distorts everything. Everything is distorted. So it's like we never had in history uh, IPOs, new issues, where the companies are losing billions of dollars per year, but people pay a fantasy price. This is one of the consequences of zero interest rates or below zero interest rates. Fair enough. <laughs> wow. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> yeah. Fine, fine. So the, the financial industry is globalized and as, as you mentioned is so crazy, right? That now even the central banks are investing in the stock market. The global player and the stock market companies are producing and selling all over the world. Do you still see any advantages or disadvantages of US, European and Asian located companies? And in which areas do you see economical growth potential? Well, we have to distinguish between the economic potential and the performance of assets. Because you can have a, essentially a country where there is no growth, like Switzerland and stocks move up. <laughs> you understand? And you can have a country where uh, the economy is growing a lot, like Vietnam, and stocks have basically been disappointing. They've gone up, but then they came down again. So we have to distinguish. Clearly, from my perspective, and I travel a reasonable amount of time, and I see many different countries, I think Asia has by far the best potential. You know, you look at China, India, uh, we already have essentially 
more than a third of the global population living in these just two countries. Then you take Indochina. Indochina, which would include Vietnam, Thailand, the southern part of China, Yunnan province, and then Myanmar, India, Bangladesh, and South Malaysia, and Singapore, and further south, Indonesia. You take the whole region there, you have again a huge economic block with enormous potential because these countries are being now kind of uh, connected yeah. through rails and bridges and roads built mostly by the Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> but at least they built something, you understand? This is amazing if you look at some of the projects the Chinese built. Industrious, aren't they? Yeah, it's unbelievable mm. because it requires very high technology to build, say, a mine in the middle of nowhere in Mongolia, or it takes a lot of technology to build a road through the mountains. I mean, we in Switzerland, we've done this for more than 200 years, but it's more expensive to do in Switzerland than to do it, it with a Chinese construction company. That's the big difference. And when the Chinese say they do something, it's done. Yeah. The Americans, they say, oh, we need financing by the World Bank or Export Import Bank or whatever it is. And then all these idiots that work for these organizations travel to these countries for 10 years, stay in the best hotels and still can't make up their mind. And so never, never anything gets done. Oh, that's wonderful. So like, um, obviously with, with, with that in mind, you, you mentioned about Vietnam having exponential, exponential growth. However, there was, you know, when in the stock market, there has been a slump. So is there, is there any time when you believe that that would level out? Yes, actually, this is a very good question because if I look at the world, I think increasingly we will see a move away from indexing. You see, the last, say, 10, 15 years, institutions, they came to believe that to invest in an index through an in ETF uh, that has very low costs is more rewarding than to give the money to a manager. Mm. But I believe we're moving now into an environment where stock selection will become very important. If you look at China, mm. the Chinese market has performed badly over the last few years, with the exception of this year, it rose by almost 20%, and now it came down, but it's still up something like 15%. But by and large, a lot of Chinese companies have been a disaster. But some companies have done very well. You know, Chongqing Beer, they have a brewery, and it's... Uh, a joint venture between Carlsberg and the Chinese brewery, and they've done very well. Or you take the Shanghai International Airport. An airport is a very desirable kind of infrastructure because you own real estate and you can rent it out to the shopkeepers, to the duty-free shops and so forth. So the, again, the stock has essentially trebled in the last uh, one year. Or you take uh, Meng Niu, China Meng Niu. It's a joint venture with Danone. Uh, it's very successful. And you have in China some companies that are world leaders. That's why the Americans hate China so much, because they thought we can kind of colonize China and behave like imperialists. In other words, the dumb Asians, they work in factories, and uh, make shoes and whatever it is, they sell them to Nike for $10 and Nike puts a stamp on it and sells it for 120 But that has changed. Now the Chinese, like Huawei, is way ahead in terms of patents and technology, uh, way ahead of American companies. That's why they, they are so upset. <laughs> Suddenly, the 
little baby, uh, the little Frankenstein, has become a big Frankenstein. And that annoys the Americans. <laughs> Interesting. So a similar bubble could be the hype about medical cannabis companies in Canada and the US. On the other hand, more and more countries are talking about legislation. You are living in Thailand and the government is planning to open soon. South Korea opened already. The market is huge. How do you see this investment opportunity? Well, if you look, say, at the dot-com bubble, uh, a lot of companies went out of business or the stock went down and never recovered fully. Cisco never recovered fully and Intel briefly recovered, but uh, just briefly. But the, the point I want to make, you will have thousands of companies that are in that industry, cannabis. And maybe 10 will do very well and the rest will not do so well. And a lot of companies will go out of business. A lot of companies will be taken over. So what I hinted at before, the selectivity will be very important. Say, if in 99 you invested in a basket of Nasdaq stocks, the high-tech, media, telecommunication, most stocks lost money. But all you needed is one, Amazon, to do very well. After 2000, the peak in 2000, Amazon went down 70%, but then it recovered and made new highs and has been a very good investment. So I think if you take a long-term approach to the sector, uh, I, I tend to think that there is a huge opportunity lying ahead. But as I said, it's like in mining, most mining companies that are listed in Vancouver, they go bust, maybe 95%, or they never make money. But all you need is one that makes money and it can go up a lot. And so how long have you lived in Thailand now? Well, I lived 30 years in Hong Kong and now almost 20 years in Thailand. Wow. And so what, what, are the, what would you say are the, the biggest financial differences between Thailand now and Hong Kong potentially in its peak? Well, Thailand is a completely different society than Hong Kong. One of the advantages of this country is ha it has a lot of land and there will never be any starvation in Thailand. But that's also a disadvantage because it doesn't give people a very strong incentive to work. You understand, if someone uh, works and suddenly doesn't feel like working tomorrow, he just goes home and lives with the family on the farm or in uh, very simple conditions, but he'll survive. And he's happy. Because we also have here a society that shares. If you go somewhere and people are eating, they will immediately offer some food to you. Hong Kong is a city without anything at all. The water has to be imported, the oil has to be imported, any appliance has to be imported and so forth and so on. Wine has to be imported, whiskey has to be imported. They basically don't produce anything, but it's a trading center. It's like Monaco. Monaco doesn't produce anything, but it's a center. It's a convention center. It has a F1 race and Hong Kong has lots of conventions and more and more because now Chinese companies they like to have their conventions or conferences in Hong Kong. So it's a totally different environment from Thailand. And I also have to say, you know, there is this big discussion in the world about the evil white man and colonialism. But say colonialism in the last 50 years was very different than in the 19th century. So Hong Kong was a colonial uh, city owned by the British until 1997. But the British in Hong Kong were not pushing down the Chinese. On the contrary, under the British, uh, people strived, like also in Singapore. And so uh, Hong Kong then became part of China, but they still have a lot of autonomy 
although maybe in time it will be a Chinese city. But now they have this project, the Great Bay Area. And this is going to be a huge thing because it will be Hong Kong, Guangzhou and uh, Macau, Shenzhen all together. That will be a region with a GDP larger than Australia. Wow. Yes, oh, uh, I think the potential is actually quite good. Now, if you ask me about property prices in Hong Kong, they're very high. Yes, I agree. They're too high, but equally, uh, because uh, because of the low taxation in Hong Kong, it's the same low taxation in Monaco, essentially keeps property prices very high because people with money, they like to stay in a low taxation area and they avoid idiotic uh, locations like France and uh, New Jersey and California where taxes on individuals are very high. They just leave. Yeah, interesting. So, just to go into uh, Thai freeze dry is a freeze drying organic herbs. Uh, I'm sorry, Thai freeze dry is freeze drying organic herbs and prepared for the stock market listing at Vancouver and Frankfurt Stock Exchange in 2019. At the moment, Thai freeze dry is building a new facility for high quality and high efficient CBD production. What do you think? Could the health industry and alternative medicine move as the next super trend? Yes, I think. Uh... If you look at the drug industry, it's a very questionable industry. I mean, it's like the food industry, Monsanto. All these industries is eventually become like a mafia organization. And the pharmaceutical industry, they have basically no interest in healing you. They want you to keep on buying the drugs for the rest of your life. You understand? Yeah, yeah. The most important in life is a repeat customer. If you're a whore, you want a good customer that comes for a long time to you. Yes, to find each time a new one is a high <laughs> risk. So you want repeat customers. Uh, every brand knows that. And. Uh, so I think that um, the drug industry gradually will become very uh, controversial. Like the food industry, this whole GMO and the pesticides and the insecticides and so forth that uh, you know come under a lot of pressure. And now we've seen it in uh, America with Johnson and Johnson and especially Purdue, who produced opioids. This is a poison, it is not the drug, but it's been sold as a, a relief. And I'm sure it offers some relief, but it also makes people dependent. And that this was allowed to happen is incredible. But I believe that people, and as you know, Chinese medicine is largely based on natural uh, medicine like also the natives in America, we used to call them Red Indians, but that is politically no longer correct. So the natives, uh, they used also herbs as a medicine and in some cases quite successfully. So I believe that uh, anything that is natural will become a big industry if it offers some relief. So, so you know, and I think uh, this whole cannabis medically has uh, a lot to offer. So in, on, on that respect then, um, obviously a lot of the nations with temperate climates, do you think that they're scared of, let's say, tropical climates such as Thailand? Well, that I don't know, but I can tell you one thing. I live here essentially 30 meters from the river. The other house, the living house, this is my office, the living house uh, is on the river. If you grow something, you can grow a big tree within three years. 
I mean, we don't grow the trees anymore because we have large trees. Actually, we cut them down, we have but then they grow again very rapidly. It's amazing. Uh, you can shave them off and they grow again right away. But my neighbor across the river, he planted some trees maybe two, three years ago. There are trees already. I mean, this is an incredibly fertile region, the north of Thailand, incredibly fertile. That's wonderful. So commodities like precious metals and uh, agriculture are assets you often mention in your TV interviews. Yes. When the central banks don't even talk about their M3 anymore. The balance sheets in the central banks and BIZ, the central bank of the central banks, are fully confused. Which asset classes do you recommend investors to, to go forward for, especially in this multiple bubble situation we're in right now? Look, I wished I knew exactly <laughs> which would be the best in the next 10 years. But let's face it, I think most markets are one way or the other manipulated, either by central banks through interest rate policies. And the interest rate policy of central banks can have a huge impact on the value of the currency. So the last, say, 18 months, the US dollar has been strong. But maybe in the next five years, the dollar will be weak. It, you just don't know. Uh, but traditionally, historically, gold, silver, uh, platinum have been a fairly good investment, but also volatile. And if you own gold and precious metals, you have no cash flow that you have to understand you own something but it doesn't create cash for you every year if you own a property a rental property it will create some cash flow every year provided it is rented out <laughs> you know that is a big if because we don't know maybe in future uh, locations on main streets will not be very desirable who knows so and offices may change the way people work maybe they work from home who knows i th there are lots of things we don't know about the future and how society will look like and now we have this really dumb trade war this is now really a dumb idea because the global economy is already weakening rapidly. I think a lot of countries are already in recession, uh, if you measure it properly. By the way, also Thailand, I think there's no growth. I mean, I lived here, as I told you, almost 20 years. I've never seen Chiang Mai this quiet. This is the low season, May, June. But even within the low season cycle, this is one of the worst. I was in a high-end restaurant the other day and I thought, you know, I asked once because we know the owners and uh, the owner's wife just came by and uh, she was talking to my wife and so forth. And then I asked her, how is business? And she said, it is about down 30% from last year. And last year was worse than the previous year. And this is confirmed to me by everybody. Business is way down. And I go every day for a cocktail to a bar and I can see from that bar the whole street. And there are lots of bars there. It's extremely quiet. But I mean, really extremely quiet. And I look at the traffic because I drive to the city from here, which is only about seven minutes. But I always drive around the same time. You can see the traffic is incredibly light right now, even for the low season. So superimposed on a weakening global economy, which is undoubtedly the case, you have now this trade war that if you are an entrepreneur and you have to make billion dollar uh, worse of capital spending decisions. Where are you going to put your factory? In California, Mexico, China? You don't know? Because we have 
uh, a clown in the White House, I would have voted for him because I couldn't uh, justify work, uh, voting for Mrs. Clinton. But basically, he changes his mind as often as he sends out a tweet. And he's very inconsistent. And I think that uh, this then retards capital spending decisions. I mean, a good example is we had this issue about infrastructure. Infrastructure, everybody will agree, has to be improved in the US. But now the Democrats and the Republicans can't agree on uh, the infrastructure spending because Mr. Trump links it to the immigration. So how are you going to get to anywhere under these conditions and the economy will continue to deteriorate? I think if you look at the bond market recently, everybody was bearish about US bonds last October, November. Now, at the time, the 10 years yield almost went to 3%. We're down to close to 2%. We had a very strong bond market rally. The long bonds rallied more than 15% from the lows uh, six months ago. So that tells you something about the economy. You look at the oil price, down, tells you something about the economy. Lumber, down. Uh, most real estate is no longer going up. A lot of real estate is down significantly. Not a little, significantly. So would, would you, if, if in regards to property, would you recommend people to go for commercial buildings versus private? I think raw land is quite good, in my opinion. But in absence of knowing you know, how, how the world will look in five or ten years' time, I would tell any investor, look, you better diversify, you own some stocks, you own some bonds, uh, maybe you think that bonds are unattractive, but as I explained, under certain conditions they could be attractive because you lose less money and you own some real estate and you own some precious metals and you take a joint once a while to enjoy the decline of the Western world. <laughs> Thank you very much for the interview and uh, we hope to invite you to meet the Hill Tribe farmers and also the Thai Freeze Drive facility. Yes, I hope that I can taste this stuff. <laughs>